Welcome. We are here with Witch Hunt. My name is Asuka Hisa, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement. We have an incredibly good exhibition that exists between two institutions, the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, AKA ICALA, and the Hammer Museum. The show features 16 critically acclaimed international artists who employ feminist, queer, decolonial strategies to explore gender, power, and the global impacts of systemic patriarchy. The project was conceived and organized by two of our city's most admired curators, Anne Elgood, who is our Good Works Executive Director at ICALA, and Connie Butler, Chief Curator at the Hammer Museum. Nika Chilowicz, Curatorial Assistant at the Hammer, also provide an important voice and vision to the project. On site here at ICALA are five projects by Candice Breitz, Minerva Cuevas, Vaginal Davis, Every Ocean Hughes, and Lara Schnitker. We encourage you to make your appointment to visit the Hammer to see the other 10 projects by Leonora Tunis, Yael Bartana, Pauline Boudry and Renate Lorenz, Shuli Chang, Bushra Khalili, Laura Lima, Teresa Margoyes, Otto Bong Nikanga, Okwi Opakwasili, and Beverly Sims. So we have this afternoon celebration with two back-to-back -back programs. We're taking advantage of the fact that the international artists are in town having traveled with no small amount of pandemic challenges. So to maximize the time together to hear from these artists, we have provided their extended bios for you printed on your seats. So for this 2 p.m. program, starting on time. <laughs> we have artist Minerva Cuevas in conversation with Anne Elgood. Mexico City Minerva Cuevas, Mexico City based Minerva Cuevas socially engaged practice encompasses a range of strategies and media, including film, installation, performance, and site specific public intervention. She has created a new wall piece outside titled Female Earth, and there is a representation of feast or famine, feast or famine inside the galleries. So some final notes, we have a beautiful catalog, there's a stack of them over there available to purchase, and to visit ICLA and the Hammer, you will need to make an appointment. ICLA's hours are Wednesday through Sunday and we require masks, um, and if you're not already, please follow us on social media and sign up for our email newsletter, which you I think can do at the front desk. So either at ICALA or the Hammer, uh, you'll find exciting public programs ahead, so they'll be either online or on-site, and we don't want you to miss them. So thank you so much for coming, and let's begin with Minerva and Anne. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. <laughs> well, first, I just want to say how happy I am to be sitting here with Minerva and to have a moment to talk with her and reflect on her pieces for Witch Hunt. Thank you, Minerva, for being here. As Asuka said, we really didn't want to lose this very rare moment, especially in recent months, to have artists coming uh, to LA internationally to be here and to install their work and to celebrate their work and the opening. So we're really excited to have these two conversations today and talk to these amazing artists. When Connie Butler comes for the three o'clock panel, we'll do a little more, if you're still here, please stay if you can. Um, discussion around the show and its inception and, and some broader subjects. But Minerva and I were really only going to talk for about a half an hour, so I just want to dive right in. Um, I do want to give a shout out. We recently did a fundraiser to raise money for our outdoor projects, and I just want to thank all of those who contributed to this. It really allowed us to to do Minerva's uh, mural in, in particular, but also to kind of kickstart our outdoor project series. Since ICA was founded in 2017, there have been two previous mural projects uh, on the wall where you see Minerva's, one by Sarah Kane and one by Arturo Herrera, but we haven't been able to do one in about a year. So we're really excited to reinvigorate this outdoor space and Minerva, was really the perfect artist to take it on because she has worked so extensively in public space and thought a lot about interventions into public space, urban spaces, um, you know, many of the subjects that we'll get into this evening. So we are just thrilled to have it there. It feels so much 
like a welcome into the space, a way for people to identify that there's something going on in that weird yellow and brown building that we aren't sure what it is. And I've been watching people walk by and stop and take a look. So we're getting some, you know, just pedestrian traffic, paying attention to it. So it feels wonderful. So Minerva, we're going to focus mostly on the mural since it's a brand new project, but it has some very important correlations in terms of subject and intention with Feast and Famine, which is in the galleries, which is a 2015 work. And so we'll get into that one a little bit as well, and certainly some of the broader topics that Minerva um, tackles in her practice. So Minerva, um, I hope you all saw the mural. It's a little hard to miss on your way in. But I thought we'd start by just talking a little bit about the various imagery that you selected for the piece and where those images came from, your combination of them, and just the, the overall concept for Female Earth, as it's titled. Well, as an introduction, I wanted to mention first the chocolate production for the installation indoors, because I think that one being a, a previous work uh, very much sets uh, the example of how I tend to do research for projects. And in that case, it was a, an extended uh, research that has connected to other different um, contexts. It started um, uh, around the considerations of value, and also it has to do with currency, but funnily enough, uh, chocolate, cacao, and cannibalism. So all those things together at the end, um, well, yes, are, are a connection to uh, what we understand as a colonization process. And of course, colonization as a main um, structure of domination that we still live because modern coloniali colonialism is uh, probably now um, uh, linked to corporate um, power, corporate uh, exploitation of natural resources, but that, that also has to do with the structure of power that um, is around uh, gender issues. Mm -hmm. So coming from that uh, series of works and also starting a bit uh, a very important essay for me uh, written by Carlos Jauregui called Cannibalia. That book is in Spanish and German. Uh, I'm wondering if, if now there is a, a, an English translation, but it's mm -hmm. key and, and it's uh, impressive how uh, he takes us uh, through the use, the term cannibal to um, use it as an example of how very much it justified the uh, repression uh, the exploitation of natural resources, uh, civilizing the ugly ones, the Indians, the different ones, and that's still being reproduced. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to, to first mention that installation over there. I hope you have seen it already. Um, uh, we have uh, one key work that is um, a drop of chocolate falling every six seconds. Uh, that for me is probably the, the strongest piece. Uh, it could look playful. It's a magnet for children. We have seen that, <laughs> it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, as part of this beauty, uh, there is also this reference to famine because the, the drop falls every six seconds connected to the statistic, one of the official statistics of starvation in the world. So uh, for me, that's part of also the um, uh, food industry. I think food is one of the most political um, uh, things uh, as part of uh, contemporary society. Uh, and, and of course, extractivism. Um, yes, and well, <laughs> talking about the, the uh, images uh, in the mural, I thought it could be nice to have some kind of um, historical framework about what has connected ecology and feminism, which mm -hmm. comes from the 70s. No, it's an issue that has been explored. Uh, and also 
departing from the situation of um, uh, the, the capitalist conception of the world as a bunch of resources to be exploited and how different that was from the vision of the world as a living organism mm -hmm. with us included. So it seems that when that difference was marked, it was also, uh, well, the, the connection with the scientific um, revolution, no? Um, we, we started seeing how uh, science, instead of being um, uh, research or produce for a common good, ended up being for profit. So nothing is, gets research if it's not for profit. And well, we are now in the middle of this pandemic and um, it's part of... of, of and climate change, you yes. know, which is so linked, of course, to industrial farming and, you know, globalization as we know it. Um, we want her to speak into her mic a little more. Yeah, uh, Minerva, you've mentioned a book that was really um, informative for you in making Female Earth, which is a 1980 book by Carolyn Merchant called The Death of Nature. And one of the things you were just starting to get into was the connection that she makes between industrialization and capital, capitalism and patriarchy. And that seems very apt with this work. Of course, one of the primary motifs you've got is this large breast with mammary glands and things that start to feel like the, the core of the earth. And then these other um, amazing, almost print quality black and white mountains that are in the background and trees. Can you talk a little bit about Merchant's book and your thinking in relationship to that? Uh, well, yeah, in fact, that's, that's the um, historical framework uh, to say, well, this connection has been established uh, uh, already in theory mm -hmm. from the 70s, and it was very much linked also to feminist utopian literature, which mm -hmm. is beautiful. But I think along this time also uh, academic women have been already questioning in a very interesting way all these concepts. And um, before I was already interested in uh, social ecology mm -hmm. that puts at the same level the natural and human crisis, call it labor, or it, it doesn't make a, make a difference between uh, what we understand as ecology or uh, environmentalism that separates certain issues from uh, uh, social issues. So mm -hmm. it was very interesting for me to um, read about that and understand um, how this uh, link is uh, always present because I had seen that no? whenever I do research in a certain context uh, I end up uh, connecting it to social situations and uh, usually corporate power or um, governmental power. No? So uh, it's impossible to, to dissect it as problems. Or when someone talks about pollution as a problem, it's like, no, pollution is not a problem. Pro uh, the, the problem is, is the industry and the system behind that uh, allows uh, these to happen and yeah, that's a kind of um, symptom or um, result of, of this. Again, no, it's a structure. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one beautiful thing for me is to also realize in indigenous communities how language also uh, makes you travel through time and place you in uh, situations that are probably unthinkable for us, no? They don't have a word for trash in some mm. indigenous languages because it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So that's not the problem, no? it, did, it just didn't exist. Right. There was no word for it. So uh, I think for me, those uh, little things trigger a series of um, questions to, to uh, also how uh, the term feminism is being perceived and how uh, in uh, more in the academy or, or the 
uh, theorists working about these issues are already developing very interesting uh, links to coloni colonialism, racism, and uh, ending with uh, more um, uh, intuitive result. Um, and one of the theoreticians I find very interesting at the moment is um, Ochi Curiel. Mm. Uh, she brings together everything. You should write her name because <laughs> really it's mind blowing uh, how they are dissecting all these intersections mm -hmm. and nothing to do with intersectionality because that has been also very interesting uh, to read for me. Uh, it's not about reinforcing differences and then being inclusive. That sounds good, but at the end, that's not what we want. We want that the structure generating all these differences, uh, that it disappears, basically, no? So we have to, right. to start looking at things in a different approach. Um, so, yeah, for me, that, that mural uh, really uh, connected things I had uh, interest in the past, but that I hadn't really uh, focused on. Um, if uh, in interviews, sometimes uh, they ask, are you a feminist? It's like, mm. <laughs> there are so many different kinds of feminism and I totally identified with women, with indigenous women, with black women. Uh, and historically with the struggle that um, has been uh, also um, represented by, by women, no? 1920, when, when the word feminism didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So probably I would say no, uh, because there is so much struggle going on, especially when, when we talk or we, when I think about the, the indigenous communities, they don't need to identify themselves as feminists at all. Because it's so ingrained, it isn't worth calling out. Is that what, you, what you're getting at? Mm -hmm. That almost in the way that you're saying the word trash doesn't exist. I mean, in certain cultures where there aren't the kind of gender disparities, I mean, of course, we're talking about you know, ancient cultures or indigenous cultures, some of which still exist. But, you know, I mean, I think one really important question the why we wanted to make this show was the question you're asking right now, which is, what does feminism even mean today? And we asked that question to ourselves in the wake of the last presidential election in 2016 as a very stark reminder that, you know, there was so much uh, effort toward taking power and gains that had been made for women away um, and it felt a certain urgency at that moment but of course what's so important about even thinking through that question right now is the, the, the plurality of the term that it's not about a feminism it's about multiple feminisms and somebody asked me the other day why we had included artists like you and um, Audubon Nakanga, whose work is really deeply rooted also in thinking about the environment, thinking about natural resources. And, and you know, I, I, it was quite interesting to me that this person didn't really equate the, a concern over these issues, whether it's climate change or just, you know, more broadly nature with feminism. And, you know, now we're hearing this term ecofeminism a little bit more. and. I'm wondering how you connect to that term and whether there's a way in which you might describe female earth as a work of ecofeminism. Um, well, the, the moment for, for the term was also around the 70s. Yeah. And um, I think it also was connected to uh, connection only to women and uh, seeing the uh, gender theme as um, talking about either men or women, which is uh, very strange mm -hmm. because uh, gender is not about this difference, Binary. biological difference. It's about, again, another structure that has to do a lot 
with um, economic uh, and power. power. Yeah. So, um, well, as I said, for me, it's this um, conceptual uh, framework linking to how we are exploring this um, uh, theme or situation, but also what came after this um, uh, this term, you no know, ecofeminism. Uh, I think now would connect very much to the fact that. Uh, maybe it's a feminist uh, vision, but that the, um, the struggle or uh, change need to be, needs to be produced by um, all society. No, and that's mm -hmm. also why I've found problematic the term um, activist in, in some cases, because also it generates another category mm -hmm. and, and marks a difference who um, makes the effort to to be in the struggle and who doesn't mm -hmm. and it's like mm, we are all in this planet as far as i know <laughs> and uh we, we all I'll have to, to participate to, yeah to to do um uh, ethical decisions and polit political decisions in our daily lives in in our jobs or any activity we do right do you think that in thinking about the sighting of female earth and this question of intervening into public space as you've done in such a wide range of ways, which would be wonderful to hear you maybe explain a few of your past projects. You have done some billboard and mural work, but you've done so many other things. Um, I'd love you to talk about some of those earlier projects that very deliberately, in a way, in some cases masqueraded not as art. You know, they were things that sort of slipped, you slipped into the, the culture and as a way to kind of upend those systemic um, apparatus that exist that, but that often sort of allow people in or disallow them in. Um, but also a sort of second part to that question in terms of female earth specifically is what your um, hopes were for a work Cited in downtown Los Angeles. You have put some imagery on there that's specific to the actual rising temperatures in California. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit. And in a way, like what your hope is for people to take away from this work, being able to see it just as they drive or walk by on a very hot day like today. <laughs> Hotter than we were thinking it was going to be. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, uh, public space for me, I, I basically understand it as uh, public spaces where people are, where they decide to be. It doesn't mean for me that a uh, situation in a gallery space is less public, public space than uh, outdoors. And in general, my, my work is very much about uh, strategies, intuition, and sometimes uh, there is even more um, visibility inside gallery spaces than in what we call well the street or public space. It could get lost. It needs a very specific strategy, um, especially in, in large cities. If you do something outdoors, um, can get lost very easily. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not important. But again, no. If it's a strategy, it's like well, if it's the Sao Paulo, Vienna, and, and Sao Paulo is a great complex city, but if I do something outdoors, uh, maybe I'm going to miss the one million people that go <laughs> and see the, <laughs> the Sao Paulo, Vienna, and all the uh, school groups that are totally dedicated to go and see and experience um, mm -hmm. art inside an institutional space. But um, I, I value that so much that, of course, my strategy is let's do something that uh, is inside the exhibition space of that biennial. And um, there I, I, I painted a, a mural painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you nowadays even have to consider that people is going to take their selfies with the, with <laughs> the work or, um, I don't know, it's, it's um, 
really fascinating how that can be uh, uh, working no, in, in both situations. Um, the references to, to California, of course, are, uh, are there. Uh, it's not only one breast, it's two, because I'm considering the volcano the second one, so it's okay. more like a uh, laying, laying uh, a woman, uh, a body uh, there. Um, there is a reference to a fossil and how that connects to uh, energy. I've worked a lot with um, the oil industry, tar um, as material, mm -hmm. but also as this um, economy that uh, it's driving the, the world and political decisions nowadays. <coughs> so uh, many influences are there, probably even um, Atl, uh, the painter with the volcanoes. Uh -huh. um, uh, what else is there? Uh, water, mm -hmm. very important also. Of course, not everything can be there and not everything can be very complex, but yeah, it's there. Does it feel, I, I feel like when, you know, so much of your work grapples with corporate logos and company, you know, advertising, very iconic in many cases, visual imagery that you usually manipulate and very cleverly subvert. Um, if you haven't been in the gallery yet, there's a piece called Evil Time, which is the Time Magazine logo that's been altered by Minerva to, to read both ways as Evil Time. There's the Hershey's Chocolate Company logo, of course, that's bursting open with really incredible imagery of um, an illustration of cannibalism that did not actually occur in South America, as many might presume, but is an example of European cannibals from centuries ago, I presume. But a lot of times, I think, Minerva, with, your, with those images that are so recognizable and iconic, there's that kind of double take. You know, you see it and you go, oh, Time Magazine, and then you have to look and unpack it, although you're also, I think, making very powerful gestures. I think in this mural, and also in the piece you did, was it in Dallas? The very long mural that had a... Oh the gosh. red one? Yeah, the red, red one. And black. Yeah, what was that one called? Um, Fine Lands. Fine Lands. It feels like there's a slightly different aesthetic that, mm. that you're borrowing or just drawn to. Um, what feels to me like certain kind of printmaking, even the, the mountains in this mural, I think, remind me of like Japanese printmaking of mountain landscapes. And because you're not using any pre-existing logos, it just has a, a very different sensibility, like a drawing writ large. Is there anything you want to say about the difference in the kind of aesthetic of this work with some of the other mural-based works you've done or, or a kind of shift maybe in the last few years? Well, I don't think there is a, a, a difference. I have a lot of fun working with, with corporate image yeah. logos and, and even reproducing these um, structures of, of corporate presence. But um, at the end, is part of a strategy and I would say it's a visual channel it's not always talking about that specific company or corporation. I think one of the most well-known uh, brands I've modified is um, Egalité. Mm -hmm. And it's usually part of a campaign. You know, it was distributed for free as bottles of water, mm -hmm. uh, stickers, posters. I've done that inside uh, supermarkets, placing little stickers. Um, uh, creating the tomato puree cans of, of Del Monte with the new branding. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's part of a strategy, but I, I see it as um, a visual um, strategy uh, or channel that um, somehow connects your mental uh, image bank mm -hmm. with a totally different uh, conception. Therefore, it 
makes or, or it generates the, the artwork, no? this mm -hmm. um, intellectual exercise ends up giving you a reflection that for me is the artwork. That's why also I'm not an artist that is probably only uh, producing painting or murals or, or video work or uh, I, mean, I use any kind of media yeah. and you know, no food, yeah. chocolate, but also I've worked with ice cream, with, with uh, cookies, any, <laughs> any, any kind of uh, strategy, the internet. Um, uh, in, in, in Texas, I crossed the, uh, the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande, the, mm -hmm. the Mexico-US border, and some people don't see that as uh, connected uh, as, I don't know, other works, like the graphic works, but at the end it's, it's the same. It's, it's finding these um, gaps of freedom where you can still exercise, uh, yeah, not not only uh, agency, but uh, just feel free as a as a human and realize in in that um, um, piece. Uh, for me, it was a liberation of also this visual and political imaginary connected to the border. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the case of the logos, it's totally connected to the same kind of process. Yeah. Is that I came to the to the border, to the river, uh, with images of uh, violence, wall, um, repression, surveillance, and here what I see is a river <laughs> that changes its course. Uh, it's dry sometimes. Um, yeah, it, it totally li was liberating, no? Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's part of that. Uh, also, when uh, people ask me if, if I'm not afraid of um, uh, corporations reacting to uh -huh. their use of logos, which is the, probably the most common question, is like, well, they are using your brain as storage <laughs> for their image and, and their discourse, and I even see it as a, a sometimes as a, a photographic process. No, they show you the, the positive, the shiny, sleek print, but you don't see the negative, and it's always right. there. No, when I change the Del Monte uh, logo to skulls, were fitting perfectly inside <laughs> the, the logo. It's like okay, it's there. No, it's the same with Evil Time. It's like oh, it's so easy. It's already and there. So You're just pulling it out. Has a corporation ever contacted you? <laughs> now that you ask, you brought it up. Uh, um, uh, one time. And threatened you with their lawyerly ways? Uh, no, and, well, I think they know uh, that nowadays they, they would also attract more criticism doing that. Yeah. Uh, they are able, they, of mm -hmm. course. Um, in Mexico, for one solo show, in the Mexico City Museum in 2012. It was the um, uh, advertising company dealing with uh, McDonald's, mm -hmm. the one that um, called me, and mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to invite me for uh, breakfast or lunch so I could see their working how conditions wonderful they and are. how <laughs> good was um, uh, their... their uh, uh, business, their restaurant, uh, but I know very well how how Del Monte operates. So it was not uh, Del Monte uh, McDonald's. It was not um, directly McDonald's, but um, I know very well because I work in McDonald's when I was 15, Did you really? 16 wow. years old. So I know more than the publicity mm -hmm. agency that contacted me. And at the end, I couldn't go because they wanted me to go to a very specific restaurant, a very specific time. And um, yeah, it was silly and thought maybe they'll poison me in the breakfast <laughs> thing. Or that. I don't know. It was like, okay, no. And they, they just stopped calling. Um, I was busy installing the show. Uh, yeah, it was, I don't have time for you. Yeah. I mean, if they are going to do something They were trying else to win again. you over though. That was their strategy. 
the what there? They were trying to win you over rather um, than threaten you. I'm going to ask one last question, and then I think we can take a couple questions from the audience. Um, I mean, given given all of your work, I I'm curious what you would say about art's capacity to disrupt social norms or even just bring wider attention to important social issues. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a subject that gets debated a lot. What is the efficacy of art to implement change? Is that even possible? Um, or what can the role be? And I'm just curious how you feel about that. Your work specifically or just art in general or other mm -hmm. practices that come to mind? Yeah, well, it's not only art in a very specific way, but culture in general, yeah. what really um, not only transforms societies, it's part of society. So right. whenever you generate any element that is influencing, maybe not in a literal way, then uh, you are changing and generating this um, um, transformation, but as I, as I say, it's not only the, the role of artists or, or intellectuals to do that. Uh, so it's a everyday decision. So uh, in my case, I don't see my work as, as um, allowing more visibility of certain issues. I understand it as, as my life and my practice and of course my political and social perception is is there it's me what you are seeing very much um, so yeah I, I i think it totally connects to uh, social change and one of the most important things is that it cannot be measured it right. cannot be evaluated and that's part of the freedom of art because uh, that could be one of the main differences with activism, that activism has a very clear objective or even um, campaigns that can be measured with, with results. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I also take part of, of uh, many groups that can be considered activists, uh, but they can be educational or they can be related to technology, free software. No, there's there's so much to be part of that. Um, uh, I think that's that's the power of art that it's uh, it's freedom, uh, not only um, in the stage of production, but in this um, uh, uh, of not having the possibility of measuring it with any uh, parameters. Yeah. That's a really great answer. I, I totally agree with you. Um, anyone out there have a question for Minerva? I think, Oscar, do they need to use a mic or does it matter? Oscar will hand the mic around since we mic are recording. Is helpful so that we can hear the question if anybody has any questions. Anyone have a question? Okay. Raise your hand. I know there's a, oh yes. Hi. Uh, firstly, thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to ask about like hope and like because I'm an artist as well, and sometimes it kind of feels like everything kind of feels doomed sometimes. So uh, I'm wondering, like in terms of like scale of change, how do you like look at results and like what kind of keeps you going? Sorry, I didn't look at results. How do you think about like results and impact like with the work that you create? How do you like, do you have a way of measuring it? How do you think about results and impact when you make a work? Mm. I think it's only possible to see that through time. Uh, I'm very old now. <laughs> <laughs> so I started uh, working as an artist in 92 and I didn't know the things I was doing, interventions were connected to art at all. I entered the art school in 93, 94. Um, I started developing 
uh, something called Better Life Corporation Project, which, which was also intervention in public spaces, giving things for free. I also didn't call it uh, an art project. Later, it uh, became an art project because I needed a structure for the website. No, it was a plural thing, and then I needed to have uh, uh, products, uh, services, campaigns, and, and yeah, suddenly it was called an art project. I left art school before uh, finishing. Uh, they didn't um, teach me anything related to performance, to video work. It was only uh, design students, the ones that had access to uh, video work uh, or video production. Um, so that's why I say it's only through time that you can evaluate how your practice is generating something. Because I see the influence that um, those early projects had in, in another generation. Um, even changing this, uh, the brands of, of certain companies or even uh, putting a sticker somewhere before the streets were clean in the 90s. <laughs> in Mexico, you didn't see the stickers around. So it was this early moment and um, I'm not saying I influenced the, the sticker <laughs> thing, but uh, I was doing that when no one was doing that, especially as art. No, it was never uh, thought as an art practice, of course. So uh, with that Better Life uh, Corporation project, after all these years, since 98, there is still people that uh, remembers, have one student ID card for anyone that wants one to access discounts in museums or public transportation, all that. So there's people that contact me, me without doing any publicity and asks for a student ID card. So it became some kind of autonomous mm. situation or, or thing floating around. Uh, and then I, I, I end up thinking, okay, someone um, still has, still has <laughs> is thinking about this as, as something they want, they need, or they like. And it's like, okay, that's, that's uh, enough for me. You know? I don't need any other kind of measurement. Uh, children approaching, yesterday children were approaching to say they like the chocolate <laughs> drop, and that's, that's the best. That can one of my six-year-old friends who was here earlier asked if he could taste it. And I had to really disappoint him when I said it's that, good no, he couldn't. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe. <laughs> I know. I thought if you were here, you might, you might yeah, let him, but I didn't have your permission. I'm, I'm too weak. Um, let's just take one more question, and then we're going to take a little break before the 3 o'clock panel. Anyone else have a burning question for Minerva? No, everything is very clear. It's true. She's so clear. There probably are no questions. Did you have a question? No. I'm still kind of formulating it. I'm so excited to see her again from Pacific Standard Time and, and the Pato Pascual exhibit, which is where we met. Um, and I'm just curious, from that period of time, which was, what, four years ago? And you're here in L.A. now. What is your impression just of being a person in the world in LA, working on this exhibit in a different frame of mind in this COVID mm -hmm. space and we are, the temperature is rising and we're in a very, such a very vulnerable time, which was not the case, I think, four years ago. So I'm just wondering what your reflection on that, the difference of being in LA this time. Wow, Lida. <laughs> 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 well, First of all, I, I feel two years of our life were stolen, <laughs> so I don't see it that much in, in, in the past. Uh, I have to say, Lida became a very good friend. She's an academic, a professor, and she was telling me about um, uh, women uh, struggle and, and the union that after 20 years finally achieved some 
uh, success, um, las um, costureras, how you could say that? Go government, government workers. Uh, and that's the kind of, of information I connect to uh, this kind of research. So for me, knowing about that now through you also connects to that time together in the uh, Pato Pascual exhibition, the Donald Duck references um, in, the, in the work also connected to um, how colonization happens in the form even um, as, as com in comic books. No? It, it, there are so many tools <laughs> in, connected to that kind of um, uh, reinforcing the, the power structures and even Donald Duck is part of that. So, um, yeah, I, as, as I see this, yeah, these two years that were were lost or, or as I see it, stolen from, from us, uh, it has uh, to do, yes, with um, how um, human species have affected uh, the natural system. Uh, but that's something that I was also working uh, a little bit at that time, well, a lot <laughs> with, with um, also the oil industry, but um, that's why I say everything ends up connecting. You know, maybe uh, yeah, Ronald McDonald in in Paris with a, a performance or action, uh, but totally linked to the soy production in uh, Brazil and and the destruction of the Amazons. You no, know? so. Uh, those are things that maybe we don't connect immediately, but that are linked. And it's the same, you know, this, this pandemic is totally connected in the way we have allowed um, uh, the big industry uh, to govern. Thank you very much. Big hand for Minerva. Thank you so much, Minerva.